If you would, grab your Bible and turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. This is a very controversial psalm, believe it or not. There are great arguments about this psalm. Uh, some of the rabbis in Jerusalem will tell you this is about David. And everybody who reads this psalm with any bit of academic honesty will say this is by David but it is not about David it's nothing new for religious leaders to take a passage and turn it to fit their doctrines people do that with 1 Corinthians all the time about What is it? Communion. They take that passage in 1 Corinthians, do this in remembrance of me, and they make it all about communion. However, when we go from 1 Corinthians back into the Gospels, and Yeshua said, do this in remembrance to me, what was the context? The Seder, right? And it was the cup of, of salvation, right? What did we learn last week about a Jewish betrothal? Begins with a cup, right? And then he said, after he took that cup, I will not drink this again until we're together again. At the wedding feast, he's going to take that cup again. It's interesting, it's all around the Seder still. I, my personal belief is that wedding feast of the Lamb is going to be a Seder. That's my personal belief. I could be wrong, but why wouldn't it be? Uh, but he will take that cup again and then put it on the ground and stomp it because it is finished. There's nothing more that needs to be done. The wedding will have been done. The betrothal period is over. The sanctification will be over. You will be the bride of Yeshua. Which I think is far more beautiful than having a priest give you a cup and sticking a cracker in your mouth and pretending that it has turned into literal blood and literal flesh. But then we had the Reformation, which really wasn't a true Reformation. They weren't trying to go back to the beginning. They were trying to go back to about 200 A.D. after they did kick the Jews out. And they said, no, there's no transubstantiation. It's, it's not really the blood and flesh. This debate still goes on today. However, they, even though they split off, they still, you go into any Baptist church, any Lutheran church, any evangelical church, communion is, wow, don't touch it. Don't mess with it. People get really livid. Why? It's not in the scriptures. It's a very nice, meaningful, man-made ceremony. Sadly, it was done to replace the Seder. So, you see, it's not just the Jews that are guilty of taking Scripture and trying to make it, twist it to make fit their own agenda. We all do it. We are all guilty, Jew and Gentile alike. 
even in the Messianic movement, I have, I was watching a friend's worship service on their Shabbat morning. And a man I respect, a man I love dearly. But he taught a passage in a way that was very doctrinally correct within the Assemblies of God Church, but not necessarily correct biblically. But you see, are we here to learn church doctrines or denominational doctrines? No. It's one of the things I love about the Messianic movement. It's not really a denomination. There have been those who have said that since Mo got back from the rabbis' conference, he's been, his doctrines have changed. No, they haven't. I'm just as irritable and weird as I always have been. If anything, we've gone to the rabbi conference and saw, yeah, we really are a little different even from the rest of the rabbis. That's okay. Doesn't make us more spiritual. It just means that we have a different understanding. I believe a more correct understanding. But is it up to us to police them and say, oh, you got to get in line here. No, it's not. That's the Lord's job. The beautiful thing is I see the Lord working through these men almost daily. So, is anyone righteous? No, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? There is one Sadiq. There is one righteous one. And it ain't King David. If, if you want to argue that, let's look, at, let's look at how Solomon came into this world. Okay? Let's look at the whole Bathsheba thing. You had adultery, you had murder. And who knows what else was involved in all of that that we don't see. Because contrary to what people think, when, when God gave this, the inspiration to write this, it wasn't to embarrass the patriarchs and show all of their, their faults. We do things in our lives that are major sins that the Lord says, we got to deal with this. And it's a turning point in our life. We either split away from him or we come in closer than we ever were before because we realize the extent of his mercy and grace and how much we just blew it. How many of us have come face to face with that this week? Yeah. How many of us came face to face with that today? How desperately we're in need of Yeshua. This is preparation day. We're supposed to have it all together, right? No. But here's the thing. If you laid down in your sins today and wallowed and the Holy Spirit says, get up and be washed. And you got up and you were washed. That was a success. The enemy is telling you what a failure you are. The enemy is telling you what a wretch you are. In some, some groups, it's, it's kind of funny. It's, everybody likes to, to use that word. What a wretch am I? And, and you'll, hear the, the, you'll hear people, it's almost like they're trying to outdo each other with saying how wretched they are see this a lot in the Reformed movement. But then it becomes a source of pride, doesn't it? Ooh! No, 
Here's the thing. When you were wallowing in your sins and laying down in it, packing it behind your ears, you were wretched. But if you have been called by the Holy Spirit of God to get up and be washed, are you still wretched? No. The blood and water of Yeshua cleanses you from some unrighteousness, <coughs> all unrighteousness, which makes you a what? A saint of God. Do you feel unworthy to be a saint? Good, because you are. Get over it. He's already declared you righteous because of Yeshua. Now keep going. Again, it's not to be sinless. It is to sin less. When Yeshua's foot crushes that glass at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will be sinless. Hallelujah! But until then, we have to sin less. Amen? So let's read this psalm that I'm going I'm to give you a spoiler right now. It's about Yeshua, our great King. There's no debate. You can try, but your debates are stupid. If you remember the difference between ignorance and stupid, ignorance is you don't know. Stupid is you've been told and you're rejecting the truth. Let's read this. A Psalm of David. Adonai declares to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. How can this be David talking about himself? Adonai says to my Lord, no, he's put someone above him. The king, David, put someone greater than him above him. And he's saying, my God is saying to my Lord, the one above me. He's speaking of Mashiach. And Hebrews, get this, let me read you this. Hebrews 10, 12 reads this. But on the other hand, when this one, capital O, what one? Remember, this is a Hebraic document. This is a Jewish document. The anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah of God. When this Messiah of God, when this one offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from then on until his enemies are made a footstool at, for his feet. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout it out. Adonai will extend your mighty rod from Zion. Now, this word Zion is very important. Where is Zion? It's Jerusalem, right? But he didn't say Jerusalem. He used the word Zion. Why is that so important? Is it just a synonym? No. If we, if we leave it at just a synonym, we're going to miss something beautiful. That word Zion speaks of the completion of the redemptive process. That word Zion speaks of when that cup is crushed. That Zion speaks of the perfection of righteousness. What is the perfection of the process of the perfection of righteousness? Let me say it another way. What is the perfection of holiness in the object that is being loved? It's called love. Isn't the redemption story all about the love of God for his bride? Yeah. And when that love comes to completion, that love comes to its focal point, the marriage supper of the Lamb, that betrothal period's over, and now the intimacy of husband and wife begins.
Adonai will extend your mighty rod from Zion, your authority. Isn't Yeshua, is Yeshua just the Messiah, the King of, of Israel? No. This whole world is going to belong to him. This whole world will be under his authority. All of the kings will be under his authority. It says he will be ruling from Jerusalem with an iron fist. All of the kings will have to go up and bring their offerings to him. And you know what? There'll be no politicking him. There'll be no buying him. There'll be no lobbying Yeshua. Because he sees it all. He sees the back rooms. He sees the plots. He sees it all. Hallelujah. He sees it all. Your people will be a free will offering in a day of your power. We, we will be that living sacrifice. That, that perfect living sacrifice. That, that betrothal period will be over. That sanctification period will be over. We will be in his presence doing what? Serving our king. Day and night we will be serving him. Your people will be a free offering in the day of your power. In holy splendors from dawn's womb, yours is the dew of your youth. In holy splendors from dawn's womb. That's not just poetry. You see, I'm going to try to not be so caustic. There's a lot of people who will argue as to when Yeshua became holy. When did he become God? Well, didn't this just say, in holy splendors, present tense, from dawn's womb? Okay? From the present tense, entering into consummation and fertilization of that egg. He was already holy, he already existed. He's always been God. He's always been holy. We have it right here. You see, the language of God is not just beautiful. It's precise. It's perfect. And we have to be so careful with it. I love the complete Jewish Bible, but there's some problems with it. I'm reading to you tonight from the Tree of Life version which is why you guys don't look lost. <laughs> I know they read from the Tree of Life version. Uh, a, a dear friend of ours, Rabbi Eric Tokacher, the man whose synagogue Justin's going to be ending up at here in a couple of weeks, he's on the board for the translation team that developed the Tree of Life. And I love the preciseness of the language here. Because we might have missed that. We might have missed that, as so many do. Adonai has sworn and will not change his mind. Listen, when Adonai swears by himself, can it be changed? No. When Adonai makes a covenant, the laws of physics the very fabric of the universe changes to accommodate that covenant. When Adonai makes a declaration and swears by himself, everything changes. And he says, you are a Kohen forever according to the order of Melchizedek. How can he be talking about David? Was David a priest? Never. Did David ever play the role of a priest? Never. Saul did. 
Saul tried to play the role of a priest. How'd that work out for him? It didn't. It didn't. Not only did he lose his kingdom, he lost his mind and he lost his soul. He lost everything. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What does it profit a man to have notoriety at the expense of losing his soul and ending up in hell? Saul ended up conjuring up Samuel through the witch of Endor. He's supposed to be hunting these people down and getting rid of them. But he's contacting her and even going so far as to go undercover so she's not too upset and frightened when she finds out who he is. See how dirty that is? No, David did never play the role of priest. However, Yeshua HaMashiach, Ben David, the descendant of David, not only was he the priest, the high priest, he was the prophet that Moshe spoke of and promised, and he is the king forever. Past, present, and future. Amen. You are a Kohen forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Was Melchizedek a Levite? No, he was before Jacob. How could he be a Levite? He was a contemporary with Avraham. It's an impossibility. You see, according to Scripture, this pattern that we're seeing in Scripture, we have two priesthoods. We have the priesthood of the line of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, and we have the Levitical priesthood. What does Scripture tell us about the Levitical priesthood? It's an earthly model of a heavenly reality. Okay? The Levitical priesthood is an earthly model of a heavenly reality. Just like the wilderness tabernacle was an earthly model of a heavenly reality. The altar was an earthly model of a heavenly reality. The Ark of the Covenant, an earthly model of a heavenly reality. Let me tell you this. The Torah of God, as written on the scrolls, the commandments of God, the ten words, as written by God's hands on stone, was an earthly model of a heavenly reality. Who's the heavenly reality? Yeshua! Yeshua! And the Word became flesh. The Logos became flesh. The Logos is the Greek word that replaces the word Debar in the Hebrew in that Septuagint translation. Debar is a word that speaks of the Ten Commandments. It speaks of the commandments of God. And the Debar became flesh. My Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. Psalm 2, right? Kiss the son lest we be angry and he we perish, lest he be angry and we perish along the way. It's talking about kissing his feet. In other words, you're face planted on the ground. You've just been conquered. He doesn't want to partner with you on diddly squat. He wants utter and complete surrender. And he's told you the culture that you're supposed to abide by. See, Yeshua isn't like Alexander the Great. Imagine that. Alexander the Great would go in, they would conquer an area and say, all right, you can keep your culture, you can keep your gods. We're going to bring in some new gods so that you can enjoy them as well. 
All that you have to do is provide us soldiers and taxes. And the conquered lands would say, that's not a bad deal. You mean we don't have to go into slavery? Well, sakey days. Let's do this. Let's sign the, let's sign the, the dotted line. Is that what Yeshua does? No. Yeshua says, you will have no other gods before me. Right? You will honor your father and mother. You will not commit adultery. You will not covet. You will not steal. You will keep the Sabbath, Sabbath day holy. He's told us what he expects of us. He's told us what his culture is that he expects us to live by. Well, we're not under the law. No, he went so far as to take that heavenly reality that was in an earthly model and instead of just leave it outside, he wrote it on your heart. Jeremiah 31, 32. And if he didn't write it on your heart, then you don't belong to him. And you got a problem. He will judge among the nations, heaping up corpses. Yeshua just talked about love. He was only about love. How can you be so judgmental and mean? Did you even read the Bible? It says right here, he will judge among the nations, heaping up corpses. He will crush heads over the entire land. He will drink from a stream along the way. So his head will be exalted. You see, when my Yeshua, when my king pronounces his judgments, it's going to be swift going to be violent, it's going to be terrible, which is why the day of his judgment is called the great and terrible day of Adonai. Which side of that day do you want to be on? You have only two choices. The choice to surrender to him now and say, have mercy on me, Yeshua, I am a sinner. Save me from the coming great and terrible day of yours. Or we can harden our heart even more, shake our fist in his face and say, I don't want you. And be among the corpses on that day. The time for being ignorant is over. We're living in a time where we have more access to this book than at any other time in the history of the world. How many of you have multiple Bibles on your phone? I have, a, I have an app on here. It's a great app. It's called YouVersion. I'm not even going to tell you the number of translations that are available. It's ridiculous. This is the bottom. goes all the way up to the top. All of those translations in multiple languages. And it'll read to you. I can go on the internet and I can have access to concordances. So I can look up words. I can actually look at the Masoretic texts and sit there and sound it out and figure out what those words mean. I can look at the Textus Receptus and try to sound out the words and figure out what word is. And f I can look at these documents. We have greater access to the Word of God than at any time in history. And yet... My people perish for lack of understanding. Is it because we're ignorant or because we're stupid? Heaven help us. Heaven help us. So let me ask you, why are you here tonight? We are here for him. 
We are here to honor our King. I asked a friend this week, very, very old friend, many years, why do you study the Word of God? Very simple question. Why do you study? When you get up in the morning, why do you study? Why do you sit there and spend time praying with him? Why do you sit there and read his word? The answer came back, uh, I don't know. Because my day goes better when I do. How many of us would have said the same thing? But if we are going to God because our day goes better when we have that time with him? Who are we serving? Ourselves. If we don't get up in the morning and say, thank you, Lord, for letting me live another day, I couldn't, I couldn't hardly wait to get up this morning. Sometimes I will wake up in the night. Is it time yet? No, okay. Because I just can't wait to get out there and sit with the Lord. Why? So that my day goes better? So that I have the strength for the day? No, because I can't wait to be with the Lord. Because I can't wait to sit there and worship Him. Now, does the day go better? Yeah. If I don't do it, the strength will not be there because I will not be filled up with the Holy Spirit. But is that my motivation for it? It better not be. Why are we here? We're here to worship the King. We're here because we couldn't wait for Shabbat. Let me read you this. Seven hours, 35 minutes, Shabbat Shalom. That was a text from a dear friend at 1027 this morning. Can't wait to worship him. Counting down. Some of you know me. When I used to work, be in the clinic on Mondays, some of my first patients would know, well, Dr. Mo, how, how, many, how many hours until Shabbat? Boom, I could tell them. And 35 seconds, 33 seconds. Why? Because I couldn't wait. Because we feel good? No, because we get to worship him. Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you that you've allowed us to be here. We will never be able to say that enough. Thank you, Lord. Have mercy on us. Cleanse us from iniquities and unrighteousness. And anoint us so that we are pleasing to you. And that we can worship you. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Stand with me, please.